Welcome back to The Call Up, your go-to podcast on the future stars of Major League Baseball. As always, I'm your host, Arm Layton, and today we have an awesome guest, friend of mine, but more importantly in the context of this episode, college baseball and MLB draft writer for Baseball America, it's Pete Flaherty. Pete, thank you so much for taking the time, man. I'm I'm very excited. I've been texting you nonstop late at night when I do my <laughs> draft dive, so very excited to have this conversation with you and just kind of break down the draft yeah, no, absolutely. I'm uh, I'm just as excited. I, I'm so fired up to be on. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I think it's a really fun draft class, especially at the top, which I know we'll talk about. And uh, there's a lot to like both collegiately and at the prep level. There are going to be there are going to be a lot of teams that come away with their future franchise players this year, I think. So uh, as they do every draft, which is which which is what makes it so much fun. Yeah, that was what I was going to ask you because you know I don't I don't have the context as much to like how classes compare and and this is really our first uh, time really dipping the toes in terms of the call up into this draft class. We're going to continue to do more you know breaking down of the draft as we get closer and closer. But this is the first time for the listeners of the call up that they're really hearing any draft content from us for this class. We've teased some of the players. You know, we talk a little bit about the great players like Dylan Cruz and Paul Skeens and, and Langford at at times, but you know, you only really hear about those guys in terms of the context of, you know, the, the top couple rounds or even the day one guys, how do you feel like this draft stacks up to the last couple that we've had? I mean, it's going to be right on par with, if not better than the last couple of years, I think that the top of it's going to carry it with the trio of college players and crew Skeens and Langford. I mean, there's a case for all three of them, like to be legitimate franchise players with Skeens being the top pitcher in the draft. And then honestly, Cruz and Langford aren't too far apart in terms of who they are as players and their tool sets. I mean, if you can get Langford at three or you get Cruz at wherever you get any of these three players, you can, you're going to be really happy with, yeah. with all of them. Um, so I think it, it's as good of a college crop at the top as we've seen recently high school level, you've got Jenkins and Clark, and then you've got more projection pieces like Arjun Namala, whose floor is uh, it's pretty low, but the ceiling is extraordinary. And then you've got a couple more guys with front end upside in Noble Meyer and Thomas white. So there you can kind of find all the archetypes of players that you are kind of looking for at, at either level. So um, it's going to make for a really exciting draft. I think that, the growing consensus is that after the first round or so, or even after the gosh, even after the first 10 picks, maybe um, this thing could kind of go haywire, which um, is going to be, it's, it'll make for a really fun night. As opposed to what happened last year when Kumar rocker goes number three, like I was, it, it <laughs> seems to like every time we think, Oh, this draft might, you know, might be a little bit more mellow. It goes haywire. And that's why we love all drafts, but the MLB draft specifically, y- you mentioned Dylan Cruz and, and that's, kind of where I want to start because honestly, if you asked me a few months ago, honestly, if you ask me now, I wouldn't think that there was much conversation to be had about Dylan Cruz other than how good is this kid going to be and where does he rank amongst the top 100 prospects right now? But I've been surprised. There's a little bit of smoke. I know Kylie McDaniel with ESPN dropped his mock recently where he had an underslot Max Clark at number one. We don't have to specifically get into that, but is there really any chance of course, I guess there's any chance that anything can happen. But is there a legitimate chance that Dylan Cruz does not go number one? It depends what you define legitimate as, because I think if you define it as non-zero, then yes. And I think if you describe it even as as greater than 10, 15 percent, I think yes. Okay, um, then, then there's know, a chance. Seen, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think there's absolutely a chance and the candidates to go up there Um Kyler McDaniel, who does a really good job. I mean, he's got Max Clark one. He's certainly a candidate. And then Skeens and Langford are certainly up there too. And then you kind of have your like crazy, crazy sleepers that could go up there too. So um, I I think there's definitely a non-zero chance. I think that people have become pretty enamored with Wyatt Langford recently. Absolutely. Um, And it's kind of like how Skeens overtook Dolander for that top pitcher spot. It's not necessarily while Dolander was pretty inconsistent this year, um, it's not so much that Dolander was bad. It's just how good Skeens is. And the same can be said for Langford. He missed a little bit of time with a lower body injury, but he's since come back and and really lit it up. So I think that that's been part of the reason he's, he's gotten so close to, um, to cruise at the top and, and people are kind of viewing them as sort of on par players. 
And I can see that from from the data points and and I know athleticism wise, like Langford's a pretty good athlete, right? But Cruz probably better in in center long term. Yeah, I'd say Cruz is a better bet. He's a little leaner. He moves a little better. Um, but Langford can can sure as heck hold his own. Um, he's yeah. turning plus run times. Um, he's a little bit more physical than Cruz is. Um, I, I think that Cruz might be the more well rounded of the of the five tool players, but Langford certainly does have. Um, legitimately five tools in his in his um player profile whatever you want to call it but uh yeah no I'd, I'd say Cruz might be a little bit more well-rounded and in, in his tool set as a whole is just a I'd view it as a tick above so the one the one area and again you feel free to tell me where where you think I'm off or or to push back because I've known you long enough you can come on this show and tell me <laughs> I'm wrong anytime um because I really do love hearing from you on, on these guys that you've seen plenty of. And we're going to talk about the Cape Cod league team that you played a part in assembling in 2019 that I got to, you blessed me. Cause I got to call games for the, you know, <laughs> I think the greatest Cape Cod league team of all time. And that's part of the reason why I've, I've fallen in love with it, with the prospect world so much, but the only way where I can see it being justifiable to not take Cruz one, one is if you take Langford, you can save some amount of money. And you really do believe that Langford is on that same, you know, level for, I, I understand the skeins thing. I understand, you know, people wanting to, to put him in that same conversation, maybe talent wise, he he is in that conversation, but I'm never going to pass on the elite position player for an arm. I, I just, the way things have gone, I just covering the minor leagues, all of these arms, there's so much, there's so much variance there. There's already enough variance with, with prospects, but with arms, I, I just seem to never want to take one, one, one. With Dylan Cruz, though, it just to me, it just seems almost nuts to pass on this guy at number one. Like, is that w- would you say it's getting cute with it? Or do you think that that would be something if you're in a war room that you would really consider seriously? Like, what would it take for you to pass on Cruz? I guess would be the best way to ask it. I think from a monetary standpoint, if one of these guys is going to go incredibly underslot and you can maybe buy someone down to a later round and kind of get essentially two first round picks, um, that would be one way. But in terms of like actually thinking about it, I think it, you know, while Langford does have an argument to go there, same with Clark Jenkins and Skeens, um, I, at least in my mind, it's just, you're overthinking it a little bit with not yeah. taking crews. Um, and I'm with you in the, the pitcher risk um, from the, from a pitcher risk standpoint, while Skeens is looking like the best bet to be a number one starter out of this class, going to be an all-star starting pitcher at the major league level. And while that's really enticing, I just can't pass on someone both with the high floor of Cruz, which I think the floor for him is like an average everyday player yeah. with the ceiling being uh, an, an all-star year in and year out. I yeah. can't justifiably pass on that at, at yeah. one, one. I think that, you know, unless he's asking for way too much money um, I, I think that, you know, you, you, you can't let that slip past you at one. Hundred percent, and you know, go into the high school guys before we start to get a little bit deeper into this into this draft. And I'm looking at the the rankings right now on Baseball America, which you should definitely go check out. And I always tell everybody, anytime I have you or Jeff Ponce on Baseball America, absolutely worth the subscription. Uh, they do a great <laughs> job. You guys do a great job over there. But I've I've been able to see only video and and look at the data. And fortunately, I've had access to a decent amount to be able to watch both Walker Jenkins and Max Clark. And to me. Walker Jenkins is one of my favorite high school bats I've seen in a little bit. Uh, the, the swing almost reminds me a little bit of Kyle Manzardo. I'm so excited to see him in person. Uh, I, I really want to try to get an in-person look before the draft, if possible. I don't know what the event schedule looks like, but I, I'm a huge fan of Jenkins. Obviously, Clark comes with a lot of of hype and a lot of excitement. He has a lot to be excited about with the tools across the board. But do you feel like Jenkins is kind of in his own boat in terms of just prospect status or is Clark pretty much one a one B with him? So I think you can kind of slice it however you want. Like at least in the industry, it seems like Jenkins has kind of established himself maybe as that one guy with Clark. I mean, Clark's like right there. And as you mentioned, Clark is, I mean, he's tooled to the gills. He's a, an elite runner. He's a great defender. He's got a plus arm. He's been up to 97 on the mound. So, I mean, that translates alone to borderline double plus arm strength. Um, sick athlete. I mean, he's a football kid. Um, he's physically built good feel to hit. I mean, it's, it's five tool upside with him. I think with Jenkins, um, you know, he's a bit more physical. Uh, he's six, three, two, ten. I, I think the body is, um, 
you know, something to fall in love with. He's got a plus arm in the outfield. Um, and then you mentioned kind of the, the physicality with it. I think he's going to hit for more power. He's also got an advanced hit tool. So it's kind of like, I guess, pick your poison with the two of them because Jenkins probably has three plus tools as is um, Clark. Similarly, like the run and the arm, especially. And then I think the feel for the barrel, but I think Jenkins has, has a pretty decent advantage when it comes to the, to, to power. And then, I was going to say, how much how much juice do you think is in there for Max? Okay, again, I need to see him in person before I make any you know sweeping judgment there. But just off some of the video I saw, I do wonder how much how much pop there is kind of to tap into there. So he can get into it when he wants. Um, I remember seeing him at Area Code, and this was even a couple years ago. So he's changed a lot, both physically and as a player. But he can get into it when he wants. Um, but I think with Jenkins, it's like legit plus power. I think with yeah. Clark, it's more like closer to the average side. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think Jenkins doesn't have to sell out for it really either. Not saying that Clark does, but um, I think that uh, with with Jenkins, I think the separator for him is the um, the impact and 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 how consistently he impacts the ball and and how well he's playing. Kind of similar again, like talking about Skeens overtaking Dolander, Cruz over Langford, like it's not that Max Clark is like that far off from, from Jenkins in terms of ability. I'm sure that there are, and I know that there are organizations that like Clark over Jenkins. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just how, how well Jenkins performed last summer. And then this spring he's continued it and he's done it against high level pitching. So um, two really good players. I think that I, I know I personally would give the, the edge to Jenkins, but I mean, Clark's right there. He's, he's an excellent player in his own right. And, really kind of when talking about the the top five or so guys in this draft, which is in any way you want to slice it, Cruz, Skeens, Langford, Jenkins, and Clark. I mean, there's an argument for all five to go one, one. So it's, it's yeah. going to be very interesting to see where these guys end up falling. It, it's funny because you, you mentioned falling in terms of, uh, you know, just kind of where they shuffle out there, but in, in regards to slipping down the board, a tad chase Dolander has been an interesting, I would say just kind of case over the last year or so, because what he did at Tennessee last year and, and what he was putting up in terms of just what the stuff was looking like, he was on a fast track to to potentially being the top arm. And then we've seen Skeens really just continue to, to assert himself. And even then it was like, okay, 1A, 1B in that regard as well. But Dolander struggled a little bit this year. I mean, t- we're talking about a college arm that overall he's still punching out a ton. He's got a 4-2 ADRA in, in the SEC, but 107 strikeouts, 25 walks. Long balls burned him a little bit, which is interesting, uh, and, and a little bit more contact than you'd expect. A 1.2 whip is you know, not not really the most expected thing in the world, but as we've seen time and time again, there's more than the stat lines, and I think we've seen so many, so many college arms that get drafted with with kind of mediocre numbers and just end up hitting the ground running professionally. That said, where are we at on Chase Dolander in terms of where he once was peak wise, because I think he was almost a, a no brainer top five pick. Now it would probably be shocking if he went top five. It'd probably be an underslot type of situation, uh, I'd imagine, which is possible. Again, we saw Kumar Rocker go in the top five. But where do you think Dolander lands as we talk now on June 1st? So I think with Dolander, like Skeens is clearly the number one pitcher in this class. I think that you know, that's long been established. And then you start talking about that next tier and who might be up next. And then you, you start to mention guys like Chase Dolander, Rhett Louder, uh, Noble Meyer, Thomas White, um, Hurston Waldrop. You kind of get into that range of guys. And I think with Dolander, you know, he was getting to like DeGrom comps coming into this year. And, and honestly, rightfully so he was electric last year at Tennessee, two plus pitches you know, he had like solo cup control. He was dotting the ball. And when trying to kind of see what went wrong, maybe for him this year, it's like he had the same premium velo. The fastball shape hasn't been like as like as electric as it was last year. I think that the slider also it, it's flash plus and it, and it flashes plus potential. I don't think it's as consistently a plus pitch as it has been. He's relied a lot on his fastball this year. He's thrown it two thirds of the time. And there have been some starts where the slider is just not there and he'll ditch it completely. And the fastball is good enough where he can get by on it. If it's good. I mean, it's 98 with run and ride through the zone. Um, And mechanically there, like there's no glaring thing there where it's like, okay, he's doing this instead of that. And this is why, you know, he's, he's 
kind of struggled how he has. It's just like, like you mentioned, it's, it's not missing as many barrels, um, the inconsistency in the breaking ball, but um, you meant like in talking about the good with him, it is still, you know, the t- potential for two, maybe three plus pitches. Um, he commands the ball. Well, he has good field of pitch. Um, there's real ease in the delivery. It's easy upper nineties velocity, easy premium velocity and similar to skeins and some of these other arms. It's like, it is front end of the rotation upside. So that's only going to fall so long, I think, because he's a little bit of a safer bet given that he's a college arm. He's more mature. It's a, it's a good frame at six two two hundred. He moves well. Um, so I don't know how far he might I don't want to say that was going to be my, my next question because I could see Dolander if he does slip at all being that that's one of the steel types at the draft because you all the things that you mentioned I figure a, a team with with some track record of developing arms they could probably get their hands on him see one or two little tweaks here or there especially with the with the breaking ball and this guy's absolutely cooking so you can't really teach that that athleticism on the mound, the quality of fastball. You mentioned how smooth the, the mechanics are. I, it all looks so impressive. W- where's the furthest you think he could slide? I don't know about the, where I'd put like a, I don't know where he'd bottom out, but I can't find it. I mean, I, I don't know if he's going to make it even out of like the top, like 12 to 13 or 15. I'd say 15 right now is the furthest like I could see him dropping. Um, I don't know if it'll be a lot further than that, because especially if if Tennessee goes on a run here in the tournament and, um, you know, whether they make it out of a regional or uh, even if they don't make it out of a regional, if he makes a good start against like a against Clemson or, or whoever they end up facing, um, we've seen guys really improve and even make their stock here in the postseason. So Gavin uh, Williams I, was, I, was a great, great example of that, right? Yeah, exactly. So I, I think with Dolander, um, I'd, I'd say the floor is 15. And then if Tennessee goes on a run to Omaha, um, he could he could absolutely land in that like six to, to 10 range. Love it. And then so going, you know, just into the arms a little bit deeper, because especially on the prep side, that's where I definitely need to do a little bit more brushing up and excited to ask you a little bit more about that. Would you say it's very clear cut as the number two arm in this draft is still Dolander uh, or where do you think it lines up with, you know, the next couple arms? So the number two guy, I think it's like, it's almost like you can tear him a little bit. Skeens is in a class of his own. And then it's, you, they're sort of bunched up with Dolander, Louder, um, Noble Meyer, and then Hurst and Waldrip. With Waldrip, um, he's got, I, I think, the arguably the best stuff of anyone in the draft. Uh, there just is some risk with him with the reliever risk the effort and the delivery um you kind of wonder how the body might hold up but i mean it is demonic stuff i mean there's the argument you made he's got four plus pitches which he'd be the only pitcher in the class with with that kind of arsenal so he he fits in that second tier noble meyer again at the prep level um along with thomas white righties and lefties respectively um, Meyer has a really good slider change up kind of a splitter type deal. And, and he's got that premium velocity. So with Meyer, you're also looking at like two or three starter upside with white. It's the six, six lefty who is, a, is up to 94, 96 with relative ease. Um, command is a little scattered, but the breaking ball has got really good shape. It's, it's a sharp pitch. Um, the commands just still coming along a little bit, but again, it's like, two or three starter upside. And then I'd say with, with Rhett Louder, it's interesting because I think he might have the, other than maybe Skeens, because I do think that Skeens' floor is really high. I think that Louder might have the highest floor of anyone. It's a pretty safe pick, like good body, um, fastball up to 95, 96, uh, two plus pitches with a slider and change up can really, he knows how to pitch. He's got good feel for his stuff. Um, I don't know if he's got that front end of the rotation upside as these other guys do, but I think you're looking at a pretty safe, like really good for starter at the next level. So depending on who's picking, um, you know, there's an argument to be made for, for that each of these guys warrants a selection in that I'd say, I don't know. I want to want to love them all together at 10 through 20, but somewhere in that early ish first round, I think all have an argument to be made to, to be selected there. 
So who would you say has the highest ceiling of that tier? Would you say it's Waldrip with that splitter that he has going? And um, and you mentioned just the, the rest of the pitches that he has. I'd honestly say ceiling wise, I'd say Waldrip. Like the ceiling for him is a number is a front end of the rotation guy. It's ninety eight to to one hundred with his fastball. It's got ridiculous carry. He's got a back foot slider mainly that'll throw. It's got sharp two plane break. Curveball, sharp downer one. It's also got huge depth. And then that splitter is a 70 pitch. I think it's just ridiculous fade and drop. Um, it just falls off like 58 feet to the plate. And um, it's it, he's got real swing and miss stuff. And it's when it's on and he's commanding it well, it is, it's stupid. So I, I'd say he's got the highest upside, but he also comes with the biggest risk. So back to the the hitter side, and we'll go college hitter real quick here. We got Jacob Wilson, who checks in at number six on Baseball America's rankings here for the draft prospects. And, you know, I, I think he's somebody that's really generated a lot of, of steam with just simply making absolute mockery of his competition in the WAC. And, you know, we know the WAC's a very hitter-friendly environment. We know that the competition may not be the best, but he also, you know, performed well in, in other contexts. He looked good uh, on the Cape. Was he a Team USA guy as well? Yeah, so he was a Team USA guy. Um, he performed well there. It was the same, like, so I think everyone knows at this point with Wilson, the calling card um, is with him is the elite contact rate. Yeah. And it's like, well, you know, he did it at Grand Canyon. How is he going to do against better players? Um, with USA, he only swung and missed three times. It was a really limited sample size. Um, and then on the Cape, again, it was across around 200 pitches it was a miss rate of 12%. So, I mean, like he'll, he'll do it anywhere he plays. Um, the, uh, the hit tool is really advanced. It's probably a, it's close to a seven at this point. Um, and then this year at, at Grand Canyon, he ran a, a 6% miss rate, which is unbelievable for those listening or watching. It was, he swung and missed 18 times across 613 total pitches. So yeah, um, it's, it's unbelievable. And he, he, it's a 50% ground ball rate, which is, um, you know, it's, it's pretty high. Um, I know that there's questions there with the overall impact. Um, and, and those are warranted, but I think that the hit tool and the, how advanced it is and, and how it's looking like it's going to be his carrying tool all the way to the majors and, and during his, his big league career. Um, I think that's, it, it outweighs the concerns with the lack of impact. You know, he's looking at his body, you can still add a little bit to it. I was going to ask you that because I see him listed at 6'3", 185. You figure there's a little bit more room there, right? Yeah, I think that you can add, you know, even 10 to 15 pounds, I think would go a long way with him because he'll stick on the left side. He's got a good arm over there at short. He's a average, slightly above runner. Um, you know, he's he's going to stick on the left side. So it's a really appealing profile. And then on top of his tool set, you talk about the bloodlines. His dad, Jack, yeah. was enjoyed a, a, an outstanding ba- major league career. So again, unbelievable defender picks. too. So that that's the thing. If maybe Wilson, is there, is there any belief that he could develop a little bit more with the glove and, and potentially be a, a plus defender there, or is it kind of above average at best? Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean, there, are, he, he's, he's already flash plus defensive ability. He's really good over there at shortstop um, strong arm. And I think that once he gets into a, to a to a minor league system and a and a good player development de- department, they're gonna get the best out of him. So I think that while you're looking at a lot of present um like really good qualities, you're also getting great clay to kind of mold going forward yeah. and throughout his pro career because I think that there's there's impact in there. And if you can maximize that, it's a it's a very, very appealing profile. Where do you think he would compare it to like a Brooks Lee? Um because obviously Lee put up great numbers in college as well, slightly better competition. But when you look at Lee at this point, it's really good bat to ball skills. It's, you know, he'll probably stick on the left side. He could play second base. I don't know how, how great he is defensively at short I, from what I've seen. And, you know, it's more average, but he puts the bat on ball from both sides of the plate. He doesn't strike out 102 mile per hour, 90th percentile, which, you know, is, is probably a notch above Wilson at this point, but if Wilson taps into a bit more juice. You could see it. He has a little bit more projection on his frame. He's a little bit bigger than Brooks Lee. Like how would you compare these two? So Brooks, it's an interesting comp because Brooks Lee last year at Cal Poly, the miss rate was a little higher. It was 20%. I believe there were like evident struggles with spin with Lee. Um, so I think that Wilson has the, the hit tool advantage, but 
with Lee, he's got the impact for sure. Um, he's a lot physical, more physical of a player. Um, and, and he also is a legit, you know, a, a legit power threat. So I think Wilson has the edge there. I mean, excuse me, Lee has the edge there with more power. Um, but I give the, the, the bat to ball skills and, and perhaps maybe even overall hit tool to, to Jacob Wilson. Um, and then defensively also Wilson, I know with yeah. Lee it's kind of third base with, with Brooks, but with, with Jacob Wilson, um, it's, it's, a, you're looking at potentially a big league shortstop. Yeah. So um, there, it's a very interesting comparison because they are a little similar um, in their kind of tearing it up at a smaller West coast school, um, yeah. a little bit similar play style. Um, but yeah, no, I, I'd say Lee advantage power Wilson and Lee, I think will like just given the sheer bat to ball skills. Um, I think you've got to give the, actually, I don't know. Hit tool is pretty darn close too, but, uh, it's, I, I don't know if Wilson will go inside the top five as, as Brooks did, yeah. with, um, which is fair with the current class, but, uh, no, it's a it's a good comparison for sure. So I think that Wilson has the defense and the barrel feel. Lee has the I think potentially overall upside advantage. Makes sense. And I got a few more for you. One is a pretty open ended question: How high can Kyle Teal go? Catcher from UVA. Um, he, he just seems to have all the helium in the world. That's a great one because the the weakness of this class I think is it's catching, um, and that's kind of long been established by the industry and and scouts alike so it's a it's a class that really lacks catching teal's super athletic behind the plate um and on top of his athleticism behind the plate and how well he moves he can really swing it and so you're talking about a catcher who can hit who's strong defensively in a cat in a class that's weak on catching so if someone wants to reach for that, it's not unforeseen that he'll go inside the top 10 maybe even be that surprise guy we seem to see every year. Yeah, perhaps even work his way into the top seven, maybe even top five overall picks if he's able to sign for enough of an underslot deal. So um, he he's a very interesting one and a guy that I would probably have circled to look out to go really early, really, really early on night one. That was so that would that was going to be my next question. Who are some underslot candidates? You know, we see it every year, especially with the Orioles. When they get the opportunity to, we saw it with Kerstad, we saw it with Kowser. Again, we saw it with Kumar. We've seen it in different, you know, different situations here. Who is uh, an underslot candidate other than than Teal that could be taken early and and you know have some savings on? We saw it with Horton last year too. Yeah, no, I think that Teal's a great place to start. Um, that's a guy like if you really want to go underslot at one one. Um, you know, I think he could be a good a good candidate there. Do I think it's going to happen? No. Um, but if we're looking at underslot guys, it's like Teal one one, like Arjun Namala one one, uh, Max Clark, guys like that. Um, even like Langford and potentially Skeen. So, um, yeah. whether or, or even guys, guys like into the the top ten or top five that you could see potentially as underslots. I know that lately Nolan Shawnwell has gotten a little steam in the teens. Um, That's the uh, I, first baseman FAU kid. Yeah, first baseman at Florida Atlantic. His stats are legitimate video legitimately video game like but one guy that i kind of have circled um is chase davis at mm-hmm. arizona uh you probably listeners you guys probably know him as um the guy who has the swing similar to cargo yeah uh and it's 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 really freaking close it's like two it's two, uncanny but... dude it's a, you just know he watched a ton of cargo highlights oh absolutely and it's i, I love it because like usually guys will give kind of the eyewash answer or it's like oh it's like my own swing it's just how it progressed he's like no nah, i watched cargo like <laughs> i was copying that the whole time so <laughs> yeah. i yeah. like he, he's got a great arm um can can really really swing it we've seen um he's a guy that i think could he could go pretty high dylan head at a homewood floor Flossmore high school in illinois elite runner um i i think it's a I, i'd give him a strong 70 maybe even legit eight runner good defender uh there's power potentially coming um it's a really really appealing tool set um i think that you could you could see him go in the teens tommy troy similarly um a team blake mitchell i know that he, he's gotten a lot of steam recently he's another one who i was i was i was a video dive about. i i just did today um I mean, that's a nice left-handed swing for a high school catcher. 
Big time. And you look at guys who, like, again, we talk about Teal with how thin the call it, how thin the catching class is in general. Like, how far are you going to let someone like Blake Mitchell fall? And I think mm-hmm. that it's not going to be very far. So those are those are some names to watch in the teens. I'm trying to think of maybe even like a, a super deep name that could go really high. Uh, I know that with Steven Echeverria at a Milburn, New Jersey, I don't think he might go in the teens. Um, but I know that, uh, there's, there's potential for him to go in the first, like 40 to 45 picks. He'll be an interesting one. And then I'm just trying to think where else I think, I think that about covers it. Bryce Matthews is, I know a data darling. I don't quite think that he'll go in the first round. I think he's more late second, potentially early third with Matthews. Um, so I think for like sleepers in the teens, that, that kind of covers it. Yeah, and I was gonna say, are there any other any other prospects that you think you know, that you're more excited about maybe than the industry? It could be a guy that is generally a consensus top fifteen guy that you think should be top five. It could be top thirty that you think should be top twenty. Whatever it may be, are there who are the guys that Peter Flaherty is higher on than some of the others? So I really like Sammy Stafora out of New York. Um, I think that he's an excellent player. He's a plus runner. He's a strong defender over a shortstop. He's a physical kid who hit, who hits for both average and power. There's a lot of thump there. He performed well against high level competition. Um, he's a guy this spring I know has just a straight vertical up arrow next to his name. Um, so at the prep level, he's one of them. I really like Luke Kieschel at Arizona state, not a premium position like Stafora, who I think is a pro shortstop. Um, Kieschel is a second baseman, but I love the the hit power combination with Kieschel, he's he's gotten into it with Wood. He performed well in the Cape. There's a track record there. Um, I think that he's an excellent player. And then Mac Horvath out of North Carolina is another one. I know I've I've tweeted about him a bunch and like how much I like him as a player, but uh, it's legit. Like he's a plus athlete. He's got a plus arm. Um, the arm plays over a third. He's not great throwing from multiple angles. So I think that his future is in the outfield, but. When you're talking about him in the outfield, you're not talking about like a left fielder who you just kind of stick out there as a body. He's going to be either a center fielder or a right fielder. He's going to be in one of the the premium outfield spots. And they've been using him at center lately. And the routes are a little crude, but I think with feel and, um, you know, time and reps, he could get better out there. And then it's it's a really good hit power combo with Wood. And, and I saw it last summer firsthand on the Cape, and it was – you know, he was barreling balls consistently at six home runs, I think, across 18 games. Um, he's not just a byproduct of metal bats. So uh, I, I think that he he also could go on definitely on day one. Um, you know, he's another guy who, you know, you could maybe see in the first 55 to 60 picks, maybe even higher. I love it, man. And, and the last thing I'll ask you is going back to the, the 2019 Cavaliers. So. Right now is a time where we're seeing a lot of the guys from that team that you know you helped put together uh, as as the GM at the time, just being able to you know, help find and canvas all of the college talent that you wanted to see, you know, over there uh, in Katua. And man, it was so much fun to call games. I mean, we'll go through some of them, but it's been so awesome lately for the 2019 Kettleers. You had Matt Mervis debuting recently. You had Casey Schmidt debuting recently. Those guys were both mainstays on that championship team. Of course, Nick Gonzalez, hopefully not too far away from a debut. And then on the mound, man, like Kyle Nicholas has been carving it up through double A. Uh, there's Joey Loperfito with the Astros has been going off. Lope has been awesome. Guest of the show as well. And uh, he's got like a 1000 OPS and double right now. I'm probably forgetting some like, how cool is it to watch that team specifically? I know you've had a lot of guys come in and out there, but that team specifically just seemed to be exceeding all expectations because not all these guys were day one dudes. Well, some of the, you know, Matt Mervis, undrafted free agent, uh, Joey Loperfito, seventh rounder, and all of them are on the track or already at the big leagues. It's unreal. And I mean, you know, because you were in it just as much as I was. Like, we knew that, the, like, for my money's worth, it's one of the best teams in Cape League history, um, both with how they performed. They were they won the championship. Um, and then seeing them after their Cape careers with all the success they've had, it's that's going to be a really tough group to top. And I think that we knew when we were in it, especially with guys like Nick um, and Schmitty and, and guys like that, Joey Loperfito, we knew that there was big league upside. Um, but I like 
if you had told me that Mervis and Schmidt were the first two big leaguers on that team, right. Um, I would have probably said it was going to be Nick, and I know Nick I is right there as well. I would have put every dollar I had on Nick being the first guy to the big leagues. Oh, you and everyone else. So, yeah. like, seeing them, like, especially with Matt, where he goes undrafted in the COVID year, signs as an undrafted free agent, struggles a little bit in his first minor league year, and then he just completely explodes at all clicks, and he's having success at the big league level. It's been really, really special to see. And then with Schmitty. I mean, again, the calling card, the the defense, and then he's also got legit thump in his bat. So having those guys be two impact major leaguers has been just so special to see. I think Nick is going to be right on his way as well. And then looking at Lope too, I mean, we were, I know watching him in 19, you look at him and he more than looks the part. He's six four, great athlete, moves really well, can can defend well in multiple positions. He played second at Duke, played center at Duke, um, played first even, like, He'll play wherever he needs to. Um, so I, I think again with him, he's a guy that will make the big leagues and in the next year or two. And then even dipping a little further, Dante Williams in center field. Yeah. He's an excellent defender. He's up in double A. Duke Ellis, even who who had a brief stint, he's in double A. Um, Matt Donlin even is in double A right now with the Red Sox. Like up and down that roster, it's like double A, triple A, like Sean Sullivan even, triple A with Pittsburgh. McCambly. So, Zach McCambly, McCambly double, double A, a with the like there, there's a chance that there's like eight to 10 big leaguers on that team. And like, even it's just a, it was a really, really special group. I'm not sure when the league is going to see a team like that again. Um, it's, it's going to be very, very hard to replicate both in Ketuit, um and across the Cape league as a whole. That's so awesome, man. And you were a big part of that. So I I owe that to you because that was the <laughs> best summer of my life. So thank you for putting together an awesome team because I know oh, the man. other teams out there were not having as much fun as we were uh, being able <laughs> to cover was, that. That team. was unreal. The, the best part of that, and it's and it's going to remain probably the best game I've ever been a part of in my life, um, probably for the rest of my life, uh, was the 15 inning oh. game one of the championship series game that lasted from... I think it was 6.30 at night until about midnight. It was five and a half hours. And then Nick Gonzalez comes through with the game-winning hit in the 15th inning. So. Off of Joe Boyle. Uh, Off 10, of Joe it was Boyle. like 101. He turns it around back up the middle. Off Joe Boyle. And yeah, that that is one of the best baseball games I've ever watched. Oh, just unbelievable. So, yeah, no, that was, that was an outstanding group. Uh, I'd love to go back to that, man. Well, anyways... Would love to have you back on as we get closer to the draft. Definitely we'll have more and more information, more context. I'll hopefully have a little bit more, you know, firsthand looks at some of these guys, which I'll be able to give you more questions on that front as well. Before I let you go, where can the folks follow you and keep up with your work? Yeah, sure. So I on socials, I'm I'm just at Peter G. Flaherty. Um, everywhere my DMs are open. So if you want to chop it up about a player you know, challenge my opinion on any of them. I'm more than happy to go through it. Uh, and then my work you can find over at baseballamerica.com. There's stuff up there for the draft, for college baseball, for podcasts, um, kind of really whatever you want on the amateur side, it's going to be up there. So uh, feel free to check it out to um, to hit me up whenever, and I'll be happy to to chop it up with anybody. Love it, brother. Seriously, one of the best in the business. Really appreciate you taking the time, dude. And we'll talk draft again soon. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I was so honored to be on and I, I can't wait to be on again before July. <laughs> of course, man.